Hello, my beautiful doves. Welcome back. I thought about doing a video talking about my favorite costume design movies for a while now, but um, I kind of put it off because I just was really afraid of not including something, which sounds kind of weird. So just like, hear me out. There's so many movies out there. And honestly, like I haven't seen that many movies. And I feel like if I did my top 10 costume design movies or like the top best costume design movies and I didn't include one with like actually spectacular costume design, I would feel really bad about it later if I ever stumbled across that movie in the future and then, you know, flashback like Raven Baxter but in the reverse situation <laughs> where it's just a flashback instead of a flash forward where I'm like, oh my god, I wish I could redo that video again. I just come to realize that it's kind of impossible for me to ever watch like every movie made and if I have that kind of mindset, I'm just never gonna end up making a video like this. So yeah, I'm over it. I'm over it. But I decided to be more specific because there's just a lot of costume movies out there and I think I've talked about a lot of them already on this channel and so I wanted to do a video dedicated to 10 movies that I don't think get talked about enough. So what do I consider underrated? Um, honestly, this is just my personal take on it. Like you might think some of these movies are overrated or just rated. <laughs> um, I also haven't watched too many foreign movies, which yes, I'm trying to change that in the future. So these movies are very like Hollywood movies. <laughs> Mirror Mirror is a reinterpretation of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, with Lily Collins as Snow and Julia Roberts as the Evil Queen. Army Hammer plays the prince, unfortunately, and there's a few scenes that I wish I could scrub from my memory, but it is what it is. Put it down. We're done playing. Or did you not learn enough from your spankings? In this version, Snow learns how to fight and is somehow able to beat the prince who's been training since he was a child because hashtag girl boss. The seven dwarfs are robbers by profession instead of miners. There's a mysterious beast in the woods. There's some really cool CGI effects when the queen goes to seek advice from her mirror. And uh, honestly, the humor is pretty hard to get behind, but I might have enjoyed it if I was a kid watching this. Prince Alcott, I have a proposition for you. We're both single adults, roughly the same age. I don't think we're really the well, same. I said roughly. The costume designer, Eiko Ishioka, led the creation of around 400 costumes for this movie and the altering of about 600 rental costumes as well. She sadly passed away from pancreatic cancer before the movie ever hit the big screen, but her beautiful work, I think, is admired and appreciated by literally anyone who's ever seen this movie. The two best dressed characters are, of course, Snow White and the Queen. I think overall I prefer Snow's wardrobe because the colors are more my taste and I like the softness of the silhouettes, but I also think Echo did an amazing job costuming the queen whose wardrobe makes her look super gaudy, sharp, and over the top. And the wedding gown that Julia Roberts wears was so dramatic that it apparently weighed over 60 pounds and caused her to pull a thigh muscle when she turned too quickly in it. I especially like how the queen wears these bold and vibrant colors because I feel like it's such a cliche for a fairy tale villain to be wearing, you know, a dark and dusty wardrobe. It just makes more sense. Like this is even one of those things that I couldn't really get behind with the Disney version, the 1937 version, because um, the queen's personality and basically all of these Snow White incarnations is that she's very arrogant and she's extremely vain. Like that's the entire reason why she wants to kill Snow White in the first place is because Snow White is the fairest of them all. No, 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 I know this in my heart. I, I think she's the most beautiful woman in the whole world. Agreed to disagree, let's leave it at that. My favorite costume in the movie is Snow White's swan dress. In this scene, all the party guests are expected to wear animal inspired gowns. The dress has a Victorian bustle inspired shape for the skirt and wings that show Snow's desire for freedom from the evil clutches of her stepmother. In contrast, the queen wears a bold red peacock inspired gown. Snow represents the swan's elegance while the queen represents the peacock's power and arrogance. The premise of the 1956 musical comedy High Society is that socialite Tracy Lord, played by Grace Kelly, is about to get married second time around to her new fiancé, George Kittredge. Her ex-husband, C.K. Dexter, is still in love with her and the tabloid journalist there to cover the wedding, Mike Connor, also gets thrown into the mix, falling in love with Tracy as well. It's based on a 1939 play called The Philadelphia Story, which was already adapted before in 1940 into a movie starring Katherine Hepburn, Cary Grant, and James Stewart. 
As far as a quick movie review, I believe Valentina on Letterboxd says it best. The Philadelphia Story is a $300 bottle of champagne, whereas High Society is a $25 bottle of Merlot. While this one isn't as good, you can still enjoy that bottle. Yeah, so I think across the board, most people would agree that High Society is a flimsier adaptation than The Philadelphia Story, but Grace Kelly looks fabulous, so the costume design department at least hit it out of the park. The costume designer for this film was Helen Rose, and she actually designed Grace Kelly's um, real wedding ensembles for her actual wedding to the Crown Prince of Monaco. Also, fun fact, the ring that Grace Kelly wears throughout the movie is her actual engagement ring. I feel like unlike the other movies on this list, the costumes in this film don't really do anything to serve the plot other than to make Grace Kelly look good. Um, a lot of old Hollywood movies kind of only dress the main characters to look really nice and it's not to cater to any kind of storyline. If anything, I would say that her character wears chiffon fabrics throughout the movie to evoke her etherealness, femininity, and honestly ditziness. A lot of these dresses that she wears make her look like she's floating through the room. I also think that Tracy's outfits fall under Grace's personal style in general in the same way that Audrey Hepburn's outfits in a lot of her movies follow her personal style off screen. And you know, Grace Kelly was beloved by the public. She was portrayed as being very high class and very elegant and she married a freaking prince so that only added to the narrative. So all these positive attributes that people associated with Grace Kelly definitely made her characters like Tracy a lot more likely as well. My favorite of Tracy's looks is this white Grecian gown which she wears on top of an equally stunning white halter bathing suit that has this little side slit detail. The whole look is very sleek and dressing Tracy as this Greek goddess makes sense in the plot because everyone's obsessed with her. I'm a cold goddess. Shout out to all the people who actually watched this on Disney Channel when it aired. I didn't, but kudos to you guys. You all lived in a time when Disney Channel movies were actually good. <laughs> so I watched Wish Upon a Star recently. Like, I think if you follow me on Letterboxd, I literally logged it in like a couple days ago. Well, okay, by the time this video is released, I would have logged it in quite some time ago. I definitely do think that compared to the other movies on this list, this one might feel a little bit underwhelming, especially because, you know, compared to other 90s movies of the time like Clueless, the wardrobe is just very simple, it's very pared down, and you might be wondering what's the big deal. The premise of the movie is basically a Freaky Friday. It centers two sisters, Alexia and Haley Wheaton. Alexia is a senior in high school. Haley, I think, is a sophomore. Alexia is the popular cool girl. And Haley is the nerd slash social outcast. They are completely different and do not get along at all, much to their parents' frustration. I also love the parents in this movie, by the way. They are just fantastic. Then one night, Haley makes a wish that she could be Alexia, and the next day, they wake up in each other's bodies. It's exactly as cheesy and heartwarming as you would expect for this kind of movie. No, it is nowhere near as good as Freaky Friday, but it is very endearing. The pacing is really good, and I love the relationship between the two sisters. So I decided to include Wish Upon a Star on this list because even though the costumes are not very glitzy or glamorous, I feel like one, it's actually a really good movie, so I wanted to talk about it and bring more attention to it, and two, I think it perfectly represents like an achievable mid-90s high schooler's wardrobe. Alexia has a killer wardrobe that we get glimpses of throughout the movie. Alexia also regularly wears frosted lipstick, a very questionable but very on-trend makeup style for the 90s. Her parents are pretty rich given the size of their house, so that in theory obviously affords her nicer clothes than the average 90s high school student. Your limit was 200? Oh, I know, but what's an extra 100 over the course of a lifetime? But none of it is designer and all of the pieces are basic enough that you feel like a high schooler could wear this exact outfit. I also like the costumes the side characters wear. They're all very age appropriate in my opinion and match the simplistic pared down look of the 90s without letting go of the fun colors and patterns that teenagers flock to. My favorite outfit in this movie is Alexia's purple miniskirt and white crop tank top. She wears it with a white backpack that is way too small to fit any of her books and white heels. In my opinion, it's a timeless, youthful look and I could totally see someone today wearing this exact same outfit. 
Next on the list is the 1992 period drama called Orlando, with costume design by Sandy Powell and Deanne Van Strahlen. So the story of Orlando is loosely based on Virginia Woolf's novel, Orlando, a biography. The titular character, Orlando, is based on Vita Sackville West, another novelist and Virginia's lover. The movie first takes place in 1600, but jumps all across time, which is what makes the costume so interesting. But yeah, let's start in the 1600s. On her deathbed, Queen Elizabeth I grants the nobleman Orlando, played by Tilda Swinton, land, a castle, and a generous amount of money on the condition that he never grows old. I don't know why. It's never really explained. Queen Elizabeth is just very chaotic, I guess. So the movie falls under magical realism because Orlando never ages and he literally lives for centuries. Then one day in the 1700s, he wakes up as a woman. I don't want to spoil any more of the plot, but it's definitely an interesting movie. The concept is very quirky and it definitely sparks a lot of conversation and discourse about gender identity and fluidity and time. Not only do the costumes reflect the time changes throughout the movie, right? Because Orlando wears like trends that are popular throughout each decade or century, but they also exemplify how gendered clothing has changed throughout time as well. In the beginning of the film, the mask presenting Orlando wears yellow tights, a once masculine but now coated feminine garment. Later on, the femme presenting Orlando wears pants, a garment that was considered masculine until the 20th century. The Met's costume exhibition last year about time, fashion, and duration was actually inspired by one scene in this movie in particular. The curator Andrew Bolton said, There's a wonderful scene in which Tilda Swinton enters the maze in an 18th century woman's robe à la française, and as she runs through it, her clothes change to mid-19th century dress, and she re-emerges in 1850s England. That's where the original idea came from. My favorite costume in the movie, because of my bias towards the 18th century, is the robe à la française. The flower detailing is gorgeous, and the shade of the icy blue looks particularly good on Tilda. I believe it's the first feminine garment that Orlando wears after they wake up as a woman, and it's just so cool how the character kind of doesn't really question anything. They just put on a gloriously hyper-feminine gown with all the structured undergarments underneath, and they style the hair in this towering poof. It's fantastic. Here we are, a movie that I think someone in the comments is probably going to say is uh, not underrated, but I want to talk about it anyway, so I'm going to talk about it. The Fifth Element is a sci-fi campy movie that's set in the 23rd century. The main character is Corbin Dallas, played by Bruce Willis. He is a former Special Forces major and current taxi cab driver that gets pulled into a mission to stop the impending attack against Earth, alongside Lilu, a humanoid played by Mila Jovovich. The fashion designer Jean-Paul Gaultier designed all the costumes in this movie and they are completely out of this world. Get it? Out of this world? Because it's sci-fi in space? Yeah, okay. One of the most memorable costumes is, of course, Lilu's bondage outfit that she wears when she breaks out of her tank. Mila has complained, though, that because of how skimpy the costume is, doing stunts in it was pretty difficult. She said, There was a lot of skin showing, so I got pretty bruised up because I couldn't wear pads and things that other people could wear. I love the costumes in this film for how bright and funky and fun they are. I feel like it's so easy or so tempting, I should say. It's never easy to design costume design a movie, but I think it's so tempting to, you know, make the color scheme for a lot of sci-fi apocalyptic movies uh, to be dark and grim and have the characters appear as such. But in my opinion, adding color just makes the action so much more exciting. The air stewardess uniforms are my favorite costumes in the whole movie, actually. At some point in the movie, Corbin Dallas gets on a flying hotel and you see all these beautiful women dressed in matching pillbox hats, two-piece suits, consisting of a cutout top and a mini skirt, and boots. The suits combine the vintage styles of the 1960s with futuristic neoprene fabric and 23rd century normalized sexuality. Gautier also blurred gendered clothing in the film, which is something he also did in his personal collections. Take for instance the character Ruby Rod, who is played by Chris Tucker. But Ruby is a famous radio host who is always bragging about the woman he sleeps with. Meanwhile, his costumes fully subvert gender expectations. Something nice is that he's never ostracized for being gender fluid, and he's portrayed as being just as normal as the other characters. His most memorable look to me is the cheetah print bodysuit with this super wide neckline. In the 23rd century, I highly doubt our views of gender are going to be the same as they are now. Breaking modern day, present day conventions when you're doing a futuristic film, just, it's like big brain. 
He's not a perfect character though. I read this article called How Do We Interpret the Sexual Politics of the Fifth Element in 2019 and the writer Tristan Young does criticize how Ruby's interaction with the air stewardesses is very predatory and quote, in doing so, the film wrongly and perniciously tries to establish a correlation between non-traditional sexual or gender orientations and sexual predation. Okay, so this is the oldest film on my list. It's from 1933, so it's pretty freaking old. The movie was actually censored the first time it was released as well, so if you can, I would highly suggest seeking out the uncensored um, original cut of the film. That original cut wasn't actually discovered till 2004 in a Library of Congress vault, but um, since then it's been available. I don't know if it's widely available on the web, but I do know if there's any indie theaters in your area, if they've opened up and if they're showing it, I would highly recommend taking advantage of that. The movie stars Barbara Stanwyck in the role of Lily Powers. I love Barbara Stanwyck. She's one of my favorite actresses of all time. I also would highly recommend watching Double Indemnity and my personal favorite of hers, The Lady Eve. If Barbara is not playing some conniving but sympathetic little minx, then I don't want to see it. So the story is, her character Lily lives a dreary working class life in Pennsylvania. But when her father is killed in an accident, she and her friend Chico decide to move to New York City. The film follows her seducing more and more successful men to gain financial power. The messaging of the film doesn't quite hold up today, but you know, in the context of the 1930s, the only way that women had social mobility was via exploiting men or using men. So with that in mind, it does make sense. The costumes though are pretty fabulous. The 1930s is my favorite era of clothing and Lily is dressed to the nines from the very beginning. The costumes are created by Ori Kelly who also did other movies like Some Like It Hot, An American in Paris, Casablanca, and now Voyager. The costumes are in part why Barbara decided to do Babyface in the first place. Before Babyface, she was creating a reputation for herself, playing these like struggling working class women roles. In her 1974 biography, the writer Ella Smith said that Barbara's fans disapproved of all the gingham and flannel roles she was playing and wanted her to wear evening gowns. So in an interview with the New York Sun in 1933, Barbara admitted that this was part of the reason why she took the role. She said, everyone else has glamour but me, so I played in babyface. Anything for glamour. Over the course of the movie, Lily dresses more and more extravagantly to mirror her social climbing. My favorite outfit of hers is this velvet dress with the white lace details and matching gloves and headpiece. It's such an adorable outfit. Barbara looks like a doll and I think this V shape is overall very flattering and adds another dimension to the dress. Troop Beverly Hills is an 80s movie starring Shelley Long with costume design by Theodora Van Runkel. Shelley Long's character Phyllis Neffler is one of the most fashionable woman characters in Hollywood history. Yes, I said it. She was Elle Woods before Elle Woods. And then, as he turned my chair around to face the mirror, I saw it. He permed me! <laughs> The premise of the movie is that Phyllis is undergoing a separation slash divorce from her husband and she also signs up to be a wilderness girls troop leader to bond more with their daughter. Because they live in Beverly Hills, all the other girls in their troop are rich kids who don't know how to do anything. I may be a beginner at some things, but I've got a black belt in shopping. Of course, Troop Beverly Hills has a lot of major problems, including cultural appropriation and red face, this uncomfortable portrayal of Asians, villainization of masculine slash queer constructions of womanhood, and also the message that rich people are nice too and shouldn't be bullied for being out of touch with commoner culture doesn't really hold up as nicely in a pandemic world. So admittedly, I understand why a lot of people would not be able to enjoy this movie, but if you do choose to watch this movie, I will say that Shelley Long's acting is just so great like she really makes the character phyllis neffler super endearing and it's really hard not to root for her and to not enjoy her presence on screen what is this reno never go to reno girls the california community property laws can't be beat she fully embodies the maximalist 80s high fashion standard, complete with dramatic shoulder pads and ruffles on ruffles. I'm honestly not a huge fan of 80s mainstream fashion. I don't think I can ever really get behind the tutus over the leggings or those really poofy taffeta prom dresses. But with that said, I loved everything or almost everything that Phyllis wore in this movie. 
And I think like with Fran Fine, it's because her outfits have a lot of cohesion. It doesn't matter how exaggerated or ridiculous the individual pieces are. If it matches, then people think you look put together, period. My favorite of her outfits is probably this tweed jumpsuit. It's definitely one of her simpler looks, but it does have the classic 80s poofy sleeves, wide belts, and hair bow. I'm also obsessed with all of her troop leader uniforms. When Phyllis joins the Wilderness Girls, she sends all of her uniforms to her tailor so that he can modify them to reflect Katora styles. V Magazine actually reviewed this movie a few years ago, and there's this one line that I really loved. I'll read it to you all. These exaggerated silhouettes of the moment, cinched waists, pastel panniers, bustle trains, do much to convey her story. An out of touch Melrose Marie Antoinette with a heart and amex of gold. The 1930s movie fashion was really like peak Hollywood glamour. Like we will maybe never get there ever again. I mean, on the flip side, we've traded glamour for realism and for authentic stories, but on the other side, we've let go of glamour so <laughs> top hat is very cheesy if you're going to watch it watch it for ginger rogers's dresses and her and fred astaire's dancing the movie follows ginger's character dale tremont who is a wealthy model for a fictional clothing designer hence her beautiful wardrobe and she is on vacation in europe Fred Astaire plays Jerry Travers, who Dale falls in love with but in a messy, chaotic way, mistakenly believes is her best friend's cheating husband. The film critic Roger Ebert calls the plot in this movie an idiot plot, as in um, the plot is only kept in motion because all the characters are stupid. He still gave it four stars though. <laughs> So the fun costuming fact about this movie is that Ginger Rogers actually helped design her statement ostrich feather dress alongside the costume designer Bernard Newman. The ostrich feathers alone cost $1,500 at the time, which is about $29,000 today. Ginger Rogers looks beautiful dancing in this dress though because of the way that the feathers move with her. However, another fun fact, Fred Astaire hated this dress because the feathers would like fly out from the dress and like I don't know, get all over his face while he was dancing with Ginger. And so the director, Mark Sandrich, actually tried to convince Ginger to substitute the dress with a different dress, another dress that she had already worn in the movie The Gay Divorcee. Ginger was not having it though. She knew this dress was amazing and so she threatened to walk out on the film if they didn't let her wear the dress in the movie. So because she was like a top biller, she did end up getting her way, but she did say that the rest of the cast and crew treated her with a lot of attitude after the ordeal. Which is stupid because only Fred is getting hit in the face with these feathers. Like, what is everyone else's stake in this? It's misogyny. But a week after filming the scene and after he was done being a drama queen, that rhymes. Fred sent Ginger a gift, which was this gold feather charm that could attach to her charm bracelet. And he gave her a note as well with it. And the note said, Dear Feathers, I love ya, Fred. So that's the story of this dress. But if we're going to be fully honest, my favorite dress in the movie is the sequin dress she wears for the final dance number. It has this gorgeous peplum detail at the bodice, these designated panels that lengthen the dress, the soft mermaid silhouette. It's magnifique. <laughs> Barbarella is a film that I hesitate to call underrated, but I decided to include this movie anyway because I think over the years, Barbarella has kind of fallen out of the costume conversation. And also after doing some research for this movie, I found out that there was actually a lot of myths surrounding the costume design that I feel like it's my duty, my responsibility to debunk. Barbarella is a classic late 60s campy, very saucy space age movie starring Jane Fonda. It's based on a French comic strip by Jean-Claude Forrest. The story is, the main character, Barbarella, is a government representative from Earth and is commissioned by the president to stop Dr. Duran Duran, who has a weapon that could bring evil to the entire galaxy. Admittedly, as a movie, it's definitely a love or hate experience. The movie is over the top, ridiculous, and the plot feels flimsy because it's so ridiculous. Fair warning in case you want to watch this as your next family movie, having sex is one of the common solutions to any problem posed in the film. Shall I tell you what I would like? I think I know. The amazing costumes are designed by Jacques Fonteré, but a lot of people misattribute the costumes to designer Paco Reban, who designed only one dress in the whole movie. I feel really bad for Fonteré because to this day, he doesn't even get any credit for this movie. And he even tried really hard to stand out from other designers of this time period. 
He even told Women's Wear Daily in 1967 that his use of plastic in this film was to create an armor and not to create like plastic chain mail because um, he didn't want to do Paco Rabanne. And in 2007, he consulted lawyers to see if he could stop the media from perpetuating these lies and erasing his legacy, but he didn't have enough money to cover the legal costs moving forward. To add insult to injury, in 2015, the Paco Rabanne official website posted a photo of Jane Fonda wearing a Fonteré design. Just to be clear, Rabanne's contribution to the movie was this lovely green dress. You can kind of tell that the green dress was made by him if you're familiar with his work. He loved working with plastic and geometric shapes, and he used a lot of bright fluorescent colors as well. In comparison, Fonteré was heavily inspired by the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. That's why you can see that some of Barbarella's and the side characters' outfits have that Robin Hood ye olden day influence. The costumes in this movie are so fantastic, match the movie's tone in their outrageousness, and I highly, highly recommend watching it just for the clothes if you can't get into the plot. My favorite costume is actually this body stocking that Barbarella wears pretty early in the movie. I love the use of plastic to create this kind of astro breastplate and stomach, as well as the plastic detail in the shoes to give the medieval boot a futuristic look. Last but not least, probably my favorite costume movie on this list. Um, no, this list was not in order, but I did want to save the best for last. It's just my personal taste. I don't think the costume design in this movie like exceeds objectively any of the other movies I talked about, but I just really love the costumes in this movie because it matches my taste. Okay. What a Way to Go is a black comedy. It's very silly. It's very campy. The movie stars Shirley MacLaine in the role of Louisa. She is a humble but incredibly wealthy widow when we first meet her. She has a spectacular and terrible gift where every man she marries becomes extremely successful but dies prematurely. The movie follows her recalling to her psychiatrist a series of unfortunate marriages and ditzy husbands. The movie is very satirical. It parodies different popular movie styles like the movie musical and the big budget spectacle. Also, the punchline of the movie to make everything more unrealistic is that Louisa doesn't want any money at all. She actually tries to donate all of her money to the IRS. Well, I've just been reading these business reports. Uh, are you faced with ruin? I am three times as rich as I was the day we got married. The beautiful costumes were created by none other than Edith Head. Edith's budget for this movie exceeded $500,000 and Harry Winston provided about $3.5 million in jewels. Just for reference, $500,000 in 1964 is roughly $4.3 million today. She created more than 72 costumes for Shirley and the hairstylist Sidney Gularoff created matching wigs for each look. Moss Mabry did the rest of the cast's costumes because Edith said she was too busy dressing Shirley. Louisa's costumes in this movie, other than being being fun and campy to match the fun and campy vibe of the movie also reflect where she is in life and which husband she's married to. Louisa's first marriage is to a working class man and before he strikes rich, she wears gingham and plaid. When she marries an artist, she wears abstract colorful dresses and when she marries a narcissistic actor named Pinky, she wears this cotton candy pink fur coat over a strapless floor length pink gown with matching pink opera gloves and even a pink beehive wig, which is one of my favorite looks in the whole movie. It kind of goes to show how much of herself she puts into her marriages and if we want to take a darker reading, how her lack of self-identity puts her at risk for never truly finding happiness. My other favorite costume in this movie is the black bathing suit. I have never seen anything like it since, but I would buy a recreation in a heartbeat. The top of the bikini specifically with the straps wrapping around the neck like a collar, it's to die for. Thank you all for joining me today. Let me know in the comments if you've seen any of these movies that I listed, what you think about them, or if there's any movie you want me to check out because it has great costumes. Um, as I said, again, I haven't watched every movie, so I didn't purposely try to exclude a movie. I probably just didn't remember it or I haven't watched it. Um, and these are also not like the top 10 most underrated um, best costume movies either. These are just 10 movies that I really wanted to talk about that I really liked the costumes of. So thank you all again for listening and um, I'll see you all next time. Have a lovely rest of your day. Bye!